Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. Part 2 of my Intel Pentium 4 PC troubles. Now if you haven't looked at part 1, I'll put up a card here so you can take a look. But in short, I had this Pentium 4 machine here where I had installed Windows XP, I was running some benchmarks, everything was fine, my first Intel Pentium 4 experience, and all of a sudden the machine got bricked for some reason. And with bricked I mean there was no video output whatsoever. The only thing that the computer was still doing was asking for a floppy disk. That's the only thing. I tried different video cards, I even tried different CPUs, different power supplies, I checked the caps, I did some board repairs because there was one broken trace, I have to admit, but nothing seemed to solve the issue. Now, as any good trained technician, I started looking into the manual and I did discover a section on recovering the BIOS where it states that in the unlikely event that you have a damaged BIOS, there is a recovery procedure and during that there is no video support. You will not see anything on the screen. And as I was not seeing anything on the screen, but there was some disk drive activity going on, I was pretty sure that my problems were BIOS related. So I started looking into various ways on how to update or recover my BIOS. Now there are some BIOS update instructions on the Intel website and there are actually five different methods of updating an Intel desktop board like the one that I have here. So let's go over them. We have the Express BIOS update, the iFlash BIOS update, ISO Image BIOS update, Recovery BIOS update and Integrated Toolkit BIOS update. So let's look at the easiest method, which is the Express BIOS update utility from Intel, which allows you to update the BIOS while in the Windows environment. Now, if you are lucky enough to still get into a Windows environment, you will get the Intel uh, Express Update Setup program here, which does include all of the BIOS files which are needed to flash the BIOS. These are the BIO files and the by one by two by three file, which is also in this distribution. So you just click the setup program. In my case, it launches the Intel Express BIOS update and it will display a warning that my BIOS version is already installed to the same version as it is trying to update. I'm just going to continue for now just to show you. And here it says that it is ready to update the system BIOS. Click finish to update and shut down, reboot the system. It will then automatically update the BIOS to the new version and you will get a verification if the BIOS update was successful. So as we finish, we give it some time to reboot Windows XP and then during the reboot cycle, it will in fact update your BIOS to the latest version and then when you enter Windows XP again, it will give you confirmation that the BIOS update was completed successfully. So yeah, definitely the easiest method, but in my case, I am not able to get into Windows, so I cannot use this method obviously. Now our next option is to use the iFlash BIOS update mechanism. Now iFlash is a MS-DOS utility provided by Intel which allows you to update your BIOS either using a floppy disk, USB device or CD-ROM drive. Now I'm going to be using the floppy disk and Intel provides you with this executable that you can use to create this boot disk containing the iFlash utility. It involves downloading an .exe file, it will extract some files into a folder, you execute the run command which will then uh, again extract some files, it will prompt you to insert a formatted disk into drive A, it will go ahead and copy an image on that uh, disk and then copy over some files and this is the actual boot disk that you can use that will contain the iFlash uh, utility that will be used to update your BIOS. And let's take a look at what happens when we boot from this uh, floppy disk. Now, you know, in my uh, computer I didn't have any video output so I'm doing this on a working system. So it's just uh, going through the boot procedure. It has created the RAM drive here so you will get a C drive uh, created by the floppy disk. It will copy some files to that RAM disk. It will also extract some files. 
and then it just stops because it you need to confirm with enter to uh, go ahead and reset your CMOS setting. So I'm just going to do a control break here and show you guys what it's actually trying to execute here. So as you can see, it will check on the floppy disk or on the RAM disk if the iFlash utility is there. And then it will uh, use some command line switches on the iFlash command to update your CMOS uh, without any you know, human intervention. And of course, because I didn't have any video output and I had no idea that this was not a fully automated uh, CMOS uh, update procedure, uh, this one failed. Uh, as I, again, I didn't have any video output, so I didn't have any way to verify what was going on. But I considered this to be a dead end also. So I then started to focus on the ways to recover the BIOS. In the unlikely event that a BIOS update is interrupted, it's possible that the BIOS may be left in an unusable state, which is probably what I am experiencing now. So you can do the recovery process, which requires the chassis to be open to move the onboard BIOS configuration jumper, which we uh, obviously did. This process is intended to be performed by a trained technician, which I am, so not an issue. So the recovery process seems simple enough. You know, the recovery file, the bio file is small enough to fit on a floppy disk. So I thought that I would go ahead and try that. It also says that the floppy disk does not need to be bootable. It must just be formatted. So I copied the bio file, I inserted it into drive A. I did uh, place the BIOS configuration jumper correctly. I powered on the system. I waited for about five minutes, but nothing happened. And that's where things kind of got confusing for me because if I look at the manual of the motherboard, it also has this recovering the BIOS uh, section here where it basically explains pretty much the same thing. But here it explicitly states that there will be no video support during this procedure, which the other documentation of Intel did not. And here it also mentions that you need to have a uh, bootable BIOS update disk into drive A. So here there is no mention anymore of, you know, a simple formatted disk with just the BIO file in it. So yeah, this was pretty confusing to me in, um, you know, what exactly needed to be done. But I did try both methods. I, I tried a bootable disk. I tried a, a formatted non-bootable disk with just the BIO file on it, but it just wouldn't work. And it wasn't until I created my own little bootable disk with an autoexec.bat file that would just execute the iFlash command directly. And that was actually the first time that I saw some progress because as it was reading the disk, all of a sudden I noticed that it was outputting these kind of beep codes here. And that typically means that, you know, the BIOS update failed, but at least it attempted to do a BIOS update. So that was already good. And it actually turned out that I needed to copy all of the BIOS files onto the disk, where I initially only copied this BIO file here as per the documentation. But as soon as I copied all of the files to the bootable disk, and also the logo, which includes the, the splash screen, the iFlash utility, and just a beep.com just to make sure that it picked up the disk, I created this autoexec.bat file, I've commented it for now, but it basically just did a beep and then executed the iFlash command with passing in the bio file as an argument. And all of a sudden I had success. Because as it was processing the disk, I all of a sudden noticed the following. And that in fact is an indication that the BIOS update went through successfully and after a reboot, I again had video output. But something that was still missing was that beautiful Intel Pentium 4 splash screen that I showed you guys in the beginning. So although the PC did boot, I get this normal uh, non-silent uh, boot screen where I do see the Intel desktop board logo on top. In this particular case, I was booting the PC with another CPU, which had a 400 megahertz front side bus. So here you can also see the message that the memory was down clocked to uh, DDR226. But I could see that the new BIOS update was installed. Uh, I could navigate the BIOS and I was able to start the computer without any issues. But I did want to get my splash screen back. 
Now it turns out that you can use the Intel Flash utility to update not only the system BIOS, but also the user data. And within that user data, you can upload a logo in a special USR file format, which you can then upload into the CMOS. It will then reboot the computer, and then hopefully we should be able to see that old Intel Pentium 4 splash screen again. So let's give it a go. And indeed, as soon as we start the computer, we get the beautiful Intel desktop board Pentium 4 splash screen again. Now, back in the day, you had a lot of OEM vendors that were using these Intel desktop boards and they had the opportunity to customize this uh, splash screen. So Intel offered a utility to convert a 16 color BMP file into that specific BIOS logo file format, which is that USR file format. So this utility can be used on motherboards that support this kind of OEM logo display like this Intel desktop board. And it has a number of command line parameters that you can use to uh, further customize how the uh, actual splash output should look like. Now the artist in me was anxious to try this out. So I started MS Paint and I went on to design the most beautiful splash screen known to mankind. So after a little bit of tweaking, because you are obviously limited with the 16 color palette, as well as the actual file size, which originally is only four kilobytes, but this particular board can go all the way up to 12 kilobytes. So I carefully crafted this image that I saved as a BMP, and then I used the Intel utility to convert it to a USR file. So after putting my beautiful logo onto a floppy disk, all that's left to do now is load up the Intel Flash utility, update the user data, select my beautiful logo, and flash the BIOS of the machine. And sure enough, after a quick reboot, my new splash screen was installed. Okay, granted, it could use a tweak here and there, but at least now I know how to update the image. So yeah, just to recap all of these uh, BIOS woes, the fact that, you know, the PC wasn't able to start with any type of video output, no matter how the jumper was set on the motherboard, made me think that there was an issue, in fact, with a corrupt BIOS. I was a bit confused by the documentation because the motherboard manual specifically stated that you needed to have a bootable BIOS update disk in the drive A, whereas the BIOS update documentation on the Intel website clearly said that, you know, the disk doesn't need to be bootable, it just needs to be formatted, and you just need to have the IBO file on it. It also doesn't say that you need to have all of these BIO files on there because there are multiple files that make up this BIOS. And another thing, because you don't have any video output makes it also very difficult to debug something because afterwards I also found out that one of the update disks that I tried was actually faulty. I later saw that there were read errors on this particular disk, something that you can see if you don't have any video output, obviously. But yeah, pretty happy that this is resolved. All's well that ends well. Time to put our original 2.4 GHz Pentium 4 CPU back in its socket. Apply some thermal compound. A pea-sized amount of thermal compound should be sufficient. Putting the cooler back in its place, making sure that all of the four plastic clips are firmly secured. And then pulling the two levers here on top to make firm contact with the heat spreader. Now, I don't think I've covered the video card that came with this Pentium 4, and I think it's an actual nice looking bluish uh, PCB here. Asus video card, a Hercules 3D Prophet 7500, so an ATI Radeon 7500, 120 megabytes. Features S Video, DVI, and VGA, AGP, obviously. The hard drive I already showed you, so I use this Western Digital 80 gigabyte IDE hard drive. 
And with Windows XP installed, we were off to the races. I could do some benchmarking using 3D Mark 99. I had the Hercules 3D Prophet 7500 installed. I got decent performance. You know, this is a, a fairly mid-range video card, nothing high-end, but definitely a lot faster than most of the stuff that I am used to here on the channel. So it would be nice to compare this against like an Athlon XP system or, or something similar. And we were left with a 3D Mark score of 9,251 and a CPU 3D Mark score of 32,000. Now I also decided to install the Intel Active Monitor software. And this is a piece of software that gives you some insights into the system. If you launch it, you get uh, features like uh, temperature sensors. It can monitor voltage levels. It can also give you notifications if certain voltages come uh, out of range. But here you can see like uh, CPU fans, chassis fans, the core CPU temps. Here we see the voltages. We also have some uh, generic system information. Because the thing is, by default, if you use something like a hardware monitor, it isn't able to probe the temperature sensors in the CPU. So you can only see like the CPU clock and the CPU utilization. The core temp software also isn't able to pick up any temperature sensors from the Pentium 4. So it's nice to have this piece of software that uh, allows you access to these sensors. I also wanted to put some load on the system, so I installed Prime95, which is also a good way to kind of stress test your system. It has this torture test, which uh, allows you to test both the CPU and the RAM. Thought it would be nice to see how you know the, the temperature buildup would look like and got around 46 degrees but more importantly at some point i did get an error in the prime 95 test which is something which you know is definitely not good so a hardware failure was detected uh, we got this rounding error uh, while prime 95 was doing its calculations which typically indicates some kind of stability issue i also got this system alert from the intel active monitor that a certain voltage uh, was out of range. In this case it was a 3.3 volt rail which dipped to 1.6. I also loaded up Everest Home Edition which is also a nice way to kind of see some more details of the system. Here we have some CPU properties. We have our Intel Pentium 4, 2.4 gigahertz, 18x multiplier, front side bus 133, with the quad pumped is obviously 533. We have our two uh, DIMMs here, uh, DDR333. Now Everest here was able to probe the temperatures from both the motherboard and the CPU. Also had access to the RPMs of the fans and the voltages. So yeah, always nice to see some you know basic info of the system. Now you can also install the Intel Application Accelerator <laughs> setup. This is basically, I think, a way to, to boost up your overall performance a little bit by installing some storage level drivers. You can also view various properties on both channels of your Ultra ADA controller. So everything storage related can be handled with this. You can also install the Intel chipset drivers, so this will give you some additional driver support for PCI, AGP, the Ultra ADA, uh, and uh, USB support. It will also identify uh, all of the chipsets correctly here in Device Manager, so always interesting to, to install this one as well. But yeah, like we saw with the Prime 95 fatal error, I did notice some stability issues with the system. I got these kind of random exceptions in Windows from time to time. I also had the computer rebooting on me as it was starting uh, Windows XP. 
Uh, I don't know if it's related to you know the trace that the burn trace on the back of the motherboard or uh, the the BIOS update, so that will definitely need some investigation. I did run a mem test and it did found uh, some RAM related uh, issues. I know this is an old version of mem test here, so I don't know if this could cause some kind of compatibility issues as well. So yeah, getting this system stable will probably be the next step. So if you've got any tips or tricks on that, please let me know. Uh, like I said, I would like to compare the system to an Athlon XP system that I have just to see how they match up performance wise, but that will be for a future video. So like always, I hope you've enjoyed this one. If you did, please uh, consider giving it a thumbs up if you liked it or a thumbs down if you didn't. Uh, leave a comment if you like. I always try to respond to as many comments as I can. And feel free to subscribe to the channel also if you haven't done so already. Thank you very much for watching this and I hope to see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.